Welcome back to another episode of A Time to Think. Pastor Chris Tillman. Pastor Chris. Pastor Chris is what I just said. I sent out an email this week that said you did. Pastor Christ. You did. People were wondering if we got a new no. host on the podcast. <laughs> I think we'd all be better off if our pastor was Christ. That is correct. But he is. Our, the chief shepherd yeah, and overseer of our souls. Shepherd. Pastor Chris. Chris. C-H-R-I-S. Pastors in Stevens Point, Wisconsin. Uh, Pastor Josh Holland, Pastor Church here in Wausau, Wisconsin. We get together monthly to to spend some time devoted to careful engagement with uh, issues regarding the culture and the church. That's what we seek to do here on A Time to Think. You can find all episodes on major podcast platforms, uh, Spotify, Google, Apple. Super helpful if you leave a rating on those podcast mm-hmm. platforms because it just gets it in more people's eyes. So if it's been valuable to you, a great way for you to tell us it's been valuable is to rate it. Uh, and that lets us know that we're doing something here. We know yep. we get we get comments here and there. It says, oh, this is why that was valuable. But no threats r- yet. No that's threats, but, that's uh, good. Um, yeah. So if you, if you have time, just rate it, review it quickly. That bumps up algorithm stuff. Other people can share see it. it. Yeah. Share it as well. And then we kind of know that, hey, we're we're hitting the mark or we're hitting the nose. It's, it's been a helpful podcast on time to think. Uh, new episodes drop on Tuesdays. And this month, Chris, we're talking holiday stuff. Ho, ho, ho. Yeah, we had a, I'm wearing my Santa tie. It was the last episode we talked about, talked a lot about Santa. We did. The mythology of Santa, how appropriate, in what ways. It was a good podcast episode. Um, I have panda socks on. You do? Yeah. Why? Because that's what was in my sock bin today. Okay, so a little bit less um, festive, intentional. Yeah. But like we discussed in the last episode, your festivity is in the heart. We just think, though, panda, replace the P with an S. Santa. And a D, <laughs> <laughs> and a D with a T. Okay, Chris. Panda Santa. It's uh, kind of comparable. It's time for honesty hour here. Did yeah. you not dress up today because you hate Christmas? No. I did not dress up today because I went looking yesterday for a particular shirt that I will not give the details regarding here because I don't have it with me. I did not secure it. It uh, did not exist in the world of uh, Mills Fleet Farm. Hmm. So I was disappointed, and I had thought, maybe I'll I'll, I'll head out this morning on my way up here uh, to to stop at Wally World, and I did not have the time Hmm. to do that, so I decided I will dress wearing clothing I normally wear, Hmm. and that will have to do. Okay. Well, so you you don't you're not not dressed because you hate Christmas, but you never said you liked Christmas. <laughs> That's correct. Chris, we <laughs> talked just off air about how each of us has an interesting stories that give us a sometimes a sour flavor. Oh yeah. On the December holidays, and so in this episode, we're talking about not not really Santa anymore, but the other cultural symbols. <laughs> Gifts, trees, yeah. lights, music, family gatherings. So mm-hmm. we want to engage in some way, shape, or form with all of these different symbols is what we'll call them mm-hmm. of the season. And uh, can you explain, and then I'll explain, what, what has flavored Christmas a little sour for you? Yeah, well, we'll talk about the, the specific issue in the next episode, from what I understand. Mm-hmm. We're going to talk about music. But um, there was a time in my life where I worked at a Christian radio station. And I was an on-air personality at said radio station. Uh, it was not a full-time gig. You do have a great made. radio voice. It, so you. that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say something funny. Did I I'll disrupt stop. you with a compliment? No, you didn't. No, You're I was, so bad at receiving compliments that head. I just ruined you with you know, a compliment. That's fine. <laughs> so I, I worked at this radio station. And uh, it, it, was, it was fun. Um, I, we, we hadn't any children at the time. Been married for probably about a year-ish something like that, and um, it, was, it was a cool gig for me. I was in seminary at the time, and I could take this and work at a Christian radio station. Fun. Well, within a few months, I think I was hired in like August of that year, and as we approach November, November is the witching hour mm-hmm. for Christian radio when it comes to how can we get non-Christians to listen to our radio station? Well, here's how we can do it by playing endless streams of genuinely Christ-centered Christian Christmas music with Bing Crosby and Amy Grant mm-hmm. and people that just talk in a 
in a nail scratching way if you have to listen to the opening five seconds and the closing five seconds of the same song for weeks upon weeks. And, and it was so burned into my head that so began my distaste mm-hmm. for the Christmas season. Because as soon as they hear Christmas music now, it's, it's pretty much equivalent. You're transported. Oh, it's, there, there's, you know, we talked last episode about, you know, a friend of ours who found out, you know, that there was no Santa, uh, and, and she's in her, I think, late Don't 40s now, something like that. We didn't say a name, so it doesn't Yeah, matter. we didn't say the name, but, um, you know, she reflected she had quite a traumatic experience with that. This was the issue for me. Sure. This did it. It had nothing to do with Santa. It had everything to do with driving out to the middle of nowhere to this radio station and hearing the same horrid music. So, so my version of that, a little oh. bit less intense because yeah. I didn't have to intro or outro the music, but I worked at TJ Maxx for Max and Easto. probably, I would say, at least four holiday seasons. And so Oof. Uh, don't sing All I Want for Christmas is yeah. here around me. It's just... You know, funny enough, Mariah Carey just lost a lawsuit where she tried to trademark the name Queen of Christmas. Mm. And thankfully, she was not allowed that. Yeah, because that would have ruined you even further. I would probably. have never known it. Yeah. So really, what ruined me is you bringing it up. Yeah. Well, that it was even a possibility. Yeah, now you know it. Yeah. So I I listen to all of those, and it's the same thing because if you're if you're putting together a radio playlist, or if you're putting together a television show, or you're putting together a retail playlist, you're under the assumption that no one is in your store for more than an hour exactly. and a half, right? So those songs are going to repeat. But you know who is in the store for more than an hour and a half? The employees that are there for four to eight hours. Yeah. And so if there's an hour and a half cycle on repeat for eight hours, well, go insane. well golly, we get to hear Mariah yep. say, all I want for Christmas is you. Uh, so I have a similar thing. But for me, Chris, that actually leads to a redemptive element of when I find like this, this holiday season, one of the things we've been doing uh, at church is discussing the fact that for Christians, the term Advent, which means the coming, mm-hmm. the Christians are this interesting breed of people that are between Advents. You've got the coming mm-hmm. of Christ in a body, the word became flesh, and then you've got the promise of the return of yeah. Christ at the end of all things. And so Christians kind of look back to the first Advent and look forward to the second Advent. Mm-hmm. And so I've, I've actually had a, a bit of a, a redemptive development this this winter with seeing some just really rich, sometimes old songs, sometimes new editions of old songs, mm-hmm. but speaking of those two comings. And so I, I'm, I'm actually more excited to listen to Christmas music than I ever have been. It's just, it's a better, deeper, richer, truer Christmas music. Yeah. It's not the I'm still waiting for my moment. queen yeah. of Christmas. Exactly. <laughs> so music becomes one of these symbols, Chris, of, of the holidays, along with lights, trees, gifts, and family gatherings. Um, you mentioned an interesting story that I thought pictured the redemptive nature of taking a symbol of the culture, like a tree, and redeeming it for the purposes of Christ. Uh, you you mentioned you have a family tradition with ornaments. Could yeah, you, share, you remember. Could you share uh, that? Yeah. I so, listen to you, buddy. Thank you. Thank you. I may talk over you like I'm doing right now all the time, <laughs> but I'm listening too. <laughs> That's uh, fine. You know, so as a family, we have a tradition going back to, I think we first started putting Christmas tree up when we were first married. Um, and the tradition basically was that we would look for, and, and this isn't just because I'm cheap, but we, you know, so. <laughs> it totally is. Th- well, no, it's, it's not. It's not, I guarantee it's not just that. But, um, you know, toward the end of the season, they would have uh, significant clearance on items like, Christmas ornaments, mm-hmm. right? And they'd go down, targets like 75%, 90%. And the ones that would often be left would be the ones that were broken. Right. And nobody wanted. Mm-hmm. And so... Um, Preach. Yeah, so we, we kind of took it upon ourselves. Um, and I, I have a heart. It's one of my favorite Christmas books. It's called The Crippled Lamb by Max Lucado. Uh, and it's all about this little lamb named Joshua. Mm-hmm. So if you haven't read it, Josh... I have not. Yeah, you should read this. It is... Uh, I, I cry with some regularity Mm -hmm. when I read this. Uh, But it's all about this little lamb who felt left out, and he ends up, I'll spoil it for everybody, but he ends up being the little lamb that snuggles up next to baby Jesus. But he's all left out because all the other lambs could play, and he had a crippled leg, and it's very, like, very, very 
heartwarming, tear-jerking, sad kind of a thing. But it's the same type of idea for us when it comes to the broken Christmas ornaments. We have some, you know, normal Christmas ornaments on our tree, but um, we also have uh, quite a few that are missing a leg <laughs> or an arm or something like that. And it's really all for the purpose of helping our children understand that that Christmas is about redemption. So how did you explain that to your children? How often do you rehearse that with your children? You know, it's not anything super formal. It's pretty much look at the broken ornament and say, you know, Jesus came to redeem broken things. Hmm. It's beautiful, man. I really think that's beautiful. Um, have you seen the Christmas movie, The Star? It's an animated, about, follows a little donkey that's kind of the... Maybe. You should watch it because it seems yeah. to be an animated version of Max Lucado's story okay. where you have this this donkey who is looking at the royal... I don't know what you would call the royal herd of hmm. stallions and always wants to be bringing in a king, wants to be bringing mm-hmm. in a king, wants to be bringing in a king, and this mm. donkey ends up being carrying Mary. Mm. Um, and so it's it's a really playful thing. I think you and your family would love it. Cool. It's called The Star, and it's that same thing. is this this uh, rejected this rejected animal having this longing for something greater, mm. right? And uh, so I really, when you told me that the other day, Chris, I thought, man, that's just such a beautiful way to take uh, a cultural symbol like a tree, mm-hmm. which really I I love the first day that the tree is in my house because it smells wonderful. Sure. We get a real tree. Outside of that, it's really just a vehicle for other things. Yeah. There's nothing about the tree that means anything to me, but it becomes a vehicle for something like displaying that mm-hmm. God's redemption is redemption of the broken, yeah. um, which I think is is helpful in looking at all of these symbols, Chris, because um, I preached just a few weeks ago on the word became flesh. And one of the things I, I said that that meant is that the, the God who created all things, because that's what the word does in John 1. The mm-hmm. word is before all things. The word, everything that was made was made by the word, yeah. right? Well, then this word looks upon broken creation and he unites himself to the broken creation. He becomes flesh to become part of a creation. And what, one of the things I wanted our people to see is that This means God does not give up on creation. Um, And I think that that principle can be translated to some of these symbols like trees, lights, and gifts is to say there's a creation element here that maybe some people are either perverting or really just have a shallow. It's just, you know, I like the tree because it smells nice. But but we as Christians, just as God looked on his creation that was broken and, and moved towards it to restore it, we can sounds cheesy, but we can move toward the Christmas tree with our families right. in a way that says, this can display something really mm-hmm. beautiful. Mm-hmm. And so I just so appreciate that you took the time to, to share that and, yeah. and give us a slight practical tool. How can we, how can we save a buck and <laughs> proclaim Christ at the same time? Yeah, break all your ornaments, people. Yeah. Break all of them. Oh, the Chris Tillman story. Save a buck and proclaim Jesus. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> that might be my biography, actually. <laughs> Uh, anyone um, who knows me knows it'll probably sum it up. So. I think, you know, we, we have a family in in uh, Mosinee that's a part of our church that also does that really well. They own a Christmas tree farm, and every year they they not only provide an incredibly, this is country mission farm mm-hmm. in Mosinee, and they not only provide an incredibly warm and hospitable environment where you feel a genuine love yeah. there, um, but they also give charitably mm-hmm. with their proceeds, yeah. uh, showing that, that their their bottom line, if you will, is not just to make money, right. but but to then bless others with what they've been given. Yeah. So I think even even someone like Ann and Regan Porchot, they they take this cultural symbol of the tree and they infuse it with gospel love and gospel yeah. generosity. And I think that's just a really beautiful example as well. Yeah. You're fantastic people, Ann and Regan. Mm. <laughs> this podcast is not sponsored by Country <laughs> Mission Farm, but uh, it could but be. We encourage talk. you to go there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah they're wonderful. So. I, I love to talk about lights in, in regard to Christmas. Um, Why is that, Josh? So you know how you know how most food is just a vehicle for peanut butter? <laughs> like apples are just a vehicle for peanut Unless butter. You're allergic to it. Oatmeal is just a vehicle for peanut butter. <laughs> Celery even. Celery is a vehicle true. for peanut butter. Ants in a log, yeah. You know, it's just like where can I put peanut butter? I feel that way with lights at Christmas. <laughs> okay, I don't. I don't. All right, really Clark Griswold, <laughs> explain this to us. Okay, I don't. I don't really care about the tree or the garland or the wreath, but it, the tree, the garland, and the wreath have lights on them. Lights on them, right? Okay. Uh, and so for me, the lights are a huge component of Christmas that we can 
we can enjoy and redeem because the nature of December is the sun goes down earlier and earlier and earlier and earlier. And for many people, the nature of December is the onset of seasonal depression. The the, re- the yeah. reduction of light leads to an increase in sorrow and yep. sadness, right? Um, and I thought just a few weeks ago that the lights of Christmas would be so much less enjoyable if Christmas was in July mm. because the sun stays up visibly until 8.30, 8.45. And it's really, you can still f- feel the light of the sun even as it's gone down until 9.30, 9.45 right. some nights. Yep. I'm in bed at 8.45, so I would never enjoy my lights. Mm. But it is actually in the presence of darkness that the light is shown, right? It's in the presence of darkness mm. that the light is enjoyed. And how can you not hear John 1, 1 through 4 screaming at you yeah. that the, the word who created all things, he was the life and light of men and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not, not overcome it. it. Yeah. So in December, I, you know, I wake up generally about 5 a.m., which means every day I start with two to two and a half hours. And you stuff. text me around 5 a.m. too. I do. Yeah. Say, Chris, hi. <laughs> hey, buddy. <laughs> so that means I have probably two hours of solid darkness in the morning yeah. and the sun goes down 4, 4.30, whatever. Mm-hmm probably four hours of solid darkness in the evening. And, and that, those are all times where light can be shown. Mm-hmm. And I've tried, I've tried a practice this Advent to, as I look at lights, to think about Christ, the light who shines in the darkness and the mm-hmm. darkness will not overcome him. Mm-hmm. So that's been a way that, um, that me and my family have redeemed or repurposed lights, if you will. It doesn't even cost you anything, Josh. Mm-mm. It's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Any, any reflections on lights uh, as part of, part of the holiday? Yeah, I mean... There's the, the the Christmas star, right? I mean, everybody's a mm-hmm. Christmas star, right? Um, but I, I do think there's more to be said when it comes to Christmas. So that, you know, I'm trying to think of any light. There, there are lights in this little little train of wonders here. Mm-hmm. Um, lights as, as, a, as a concrete, probably a little bit different than I think. If you understand lights in the abstract, light in the abstract, I should say, um, biblically speaking, light in the abstract has a more significant tone to it than even just like looking at a light. So I think what we would encourage people to do when it comes to these types of symbols is to understand like symbols themselves aren't even necessarily sufficient for you to, I mean, just for you to like look at a light, it's like, oh, that's a nice light. Jesus is the light, end of story. For you, it's a much deeper, you know, the the, the darkness has not overcome the light. Mm-hmm. And so for, for anybody to, when it comes to like these idea of sim- symbolic acts, uh, symbolic um, messages, symbolic um, gestures, symbolic tokens, all of these things really need to be kind of, I think, undergirded with the idea that um, God, God interacts with humanity thematically. Mm-hmm. You know, so when we have in scripture themes that repeat, I mean, look at the Gospel of John and John's letters, you know, light, life, um, water. I mean, all these just different themes that show and up. And light in contrast to dark. Yeah, exactly. So there, there are different themes that show up. And I think, I think it's right to understand the world in what we would call a meta narrative to, to see a big picture, a big story. God has written this big story and he's mm-hmm. working all things according to that plan. And part of that is helping us. I mean, as we're preaching right now, we're preaching through the coming lamb and the, the theme of the lamb in scripture is significant. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you More know, significant than just, oh, lamb, Jesus. Exactly. So, you know, the other week when, when, when I opened up in Stephen's point, it was basically saying God created lambs not so that Jesus one day would be like, oh, look, here's a lamb. Let me identify with a lamb. Mm-hmm. God created lambs because Jesus is the forever lamb. Mm-hmm. Jesus has always in, been this, this lamb who has been set apart by the Father from all of eternity for the purpose of redeeming a people before anything ever happened, anything ever existed in space time. And so lambs were created so that Jesus might be displayed in this type mm-hmm. of animal. Light for us physically, when God said that there be light, he wasn't saying, that, oh, it's, it's dark. Let's turn some lights on. That's not what it was. It was, there is something significant about light. And so at Christmas time, um, you know, putting your lights out for 95% of people put lights up, they don't care. They just mm-hmm. want it to look nice. But as a Christian, how do you redeem it? Identifying the big themes in life that God has given us in Scripture to celebrate truth. Yeah, and essentially it's starting with, on, usually starting with things you enjoy. You know, it's saying, I enjoy lights. That's a simple statement. Sure. Why? 
oh, I enjoy lights because they're lighty. They're colorful, and I mean, you start to ask some some basic curiosity questions. The type you would you would ask, uh, you know, I oh, I'm dating a girl I like, and she says she likes Christmas lights, and I go, why? <laughs> why? Yeah, what do you like about them? Because I'm just genuinely interested, right. right? And I don't want the conversation to end. It's, you ask yeah. those types of questions, and you you start to under, you said undergird, you start to add some mm-hmm. depth to that. And I think that's what we're trying to do with these symbols that people might just like, they like gifts, they like trees, they like lights, they like meals, they like frosty. But we're we're asking, why do you like them? And then what what is the substance undergirding that? And I... I think uh, I'm thinking in terms of flavor and substance. Mm-hmm. So it's one thing for something to taste good. It's another thing for it to taste good and have substance to it. Yeah. So you think of um, taking a spoonful of butter. Ugh. Okay. I'm Southern. I love a good <laughs> butter. One good butter, right? It's just, okay. it, I think butter tastes good. Mm. But, but butter by itself has no substance to it. Yes, correct. Yeah. Man, butter on fresh baked homemade bread. Mm. Is this wonderful combination of flavor and substance, yes. and I think if you if we look at the the Christmas symbols as flavor, we all agree we like the flavor. You know, it's nice to have this or that, or uh, it's nice to see the lights. It's nice to open presents, but let's undergird the flavor with some substance, so that when we enjoy it, we're we're enjoying not just shallow something, but depth, right. so that we can, you know, we can sit in our homes and look at our tree and say, man. It's 4.45, and I hate that the sun goes down early. There's a little light in the darkness. Jesus is going to, I mean, Jesus is the lamp of revelation who shines so brightly that there is no need of sun or moon or stars. Yeah. And, and, and so you start to think about the second coming of Jesus. And um, Yeah, I think that's an interesting thing to look at. Chris, last thing we'll talk about, gifts. How do, how do you and your family approach? You've got a big family, that's right? Correct. You got a big family. You got a single income as a pastor, and I'm um, cheap. And you're cheap. Yeah. <laughs> I was giving you so much credit here. I wasn't yeah. even going to talk about your. You can make the excuses for me, but okay. at the end of the day, arm twisting has to happen. So yeah. how do you? How do you and your family approach gifts, giving gifts, talking about gifts? Yeah. Generally, I rely upon my very generous parents to provide all of the great gifts for my kids. So, um, you know. Grandparents are great at doing that. Grandparents oh, are great at identifying it. all of the, the things that they think that your kids should have that throughout the year you think, I really don't want them to have that. Um, <laughs> primarily <laughs> because it's either... It's funny because I know you love your parents. So you're yeah. being like... Oh, on, I know, ah. I know. Yeah, uh, it's either it's expensive or... Destructive. <laughs> I, or, yeah, or destructive uh, socially within the family structure. It's destructive to your ears. I, I know mean, one family who has set a a piece limit on their grandparents' okay. gifts. If it's anything over five pieces of construction or something like that, they say, don't buy it, because then the parent has to put uh, it together. The parent has to clean it up. Um, so there's yeah. your grandparent-parent relationship. Yeah. I mean, you know what? I, I think is I love putting together stuff with my kids. In fact, you know, somewhat secretly, my kids may watch this at some point. Um, it, sometimes I'll get, like, Lego sets for my kids my kids Mm -hmm. uh and you you hide them where well (laughs) well what we've what we've done what i did last year in fact was uh my son uh who is who is nine now i got him some lego um cars okay so like Mm -hmm. you can build these models of lego cars uh and so he got a i think we got him a jag and a oh man it was a Jag, and then there was a super high performance. I don't remember what it was. Anyone though. who's listening uh, below Plover, a Jag means a Jaguar. Jaguar. Jag. Jag, bag, flag, all these Wisconsinites. <laughs> we had an argument with the teenagers last night. Actually, one teenager. Why would you fight with kids? About, uh, that didn't fight. We argued. Oh, you are, okay. Okay. There were no Good punches thrown. Yeah. Okay, Josh. Okay, so you got, you, you, you got Simeon these toys. Yeah, so I got him these toys. And I love putting them together, personally. And so, you know, he'd kind of sit there with me and be like, you find me this piece? Thanks. So I'd mm-hmm. be putting them together. And he enjoys hanging out with me, doing stuff. And I, I build things with him all the time. And, and that's fun. But at the end of the day, those aren't things I normally go and get for my kids. But at Christmas time, my parents are so excited. And, and my parents, whom you've, you've rightly said, I, I adore my parents. So, um, you know, my mom literally 
we'll say sometimes in March, got the kids Christmas gifts already. <laughs> and so, I mean, in one bedroom in their house, they literally, I mean, it's, 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 it's quite sweet, but like one bedroom in my parents' house, um, they have it where they accumulate presents for the kids and they wrap them throughout mm. the year and it's just like stocked up all around this bed. So by the time it gets to December, I mean, they have an entire room that's just like full of gifts. And so I'm really thankful that they're willing mm -hmm. to do that. And, you know, in part just because of the practicalities of being a, yeah. a pastor and a single income family and everything. But, um, yeah, I'm very thankful that people are willing to be generous with my kids who are part of my family. Well, I think that's so. loaded, loaded, loaded with gospel implications. Yeah. I mean, so many things you said. The fact that you enjoy uh, the process with your son, the fact that the fact so the fact that your mother thinks throughout the year about bestowing a blessing on your children, right? right? I mean, how many how many times is our relationship with God soured from our perspective hmm. because we don't yet have the thing we desire, and yet God is continually telling us that He's storing up good yeah. for us, that He's going to release at some point. It yeah. might it might be later on in this life, or it might come in one glorious moment. Mm -hmm at the resurrection of the body, but yeah. he, God is constantly saying, I know what you need, and even I know what you desire, mm -hmm. and I'm storing up good for you, yeah. and you will receive it. And so, yeah. I, as, as I heard your sweet mother thinking about giving a gift in March, one of my thoughts was, they're not gonna get it till December. Right. And, but that's often a truth of the gospel, is that God has good for us that we will have to mm -hmm. wait for, um, and the reception of that good comes and it's beautiful. And yeah. so there's, I think gift giving is loaded with gospel implications mm -hmm. as long as we view it as a flavor that needs substance, yeah. right? Um, yeah, the worst thing, I mean, I'll, I'll say this, when I was growing up, <laughs> uh, this, yeah, this is, <clears throat> I would go to family Christmases and, and so we were quite close to my mom's side of the family specifically. We go to uh, family Christmases and I was, I was a pretty greedy little kid, okay? And it's, it's not because we had, you know, both my parents were public school teachers, my mom stayed home while we were growing up largely. Uh, so, you know, it's not like my parents were, you know, just kind of packed with, with mm -hmm. money, um, but we, we certainly had enough. But I was a greedy little kid, and I remember going to family Christmases, and there was one year where, where I showed up, and I was at my aunt's house, and everybody's opening gifts, and I open up, my gift, and I said this, I said, is this all? Oh, no. And, and so I say that in part because hopefully it makes you laugh, thinking oh, about this no. really greedy punk kid who was, I'm literally probably like nine years old, okay, um, like my son's age right now, but, um, which, and he, he may behave the same way, to be honest, but when it comes to thinking about gifts, I mean, that's like the last thing in the world that you want to have cultivated is a mentality of, well, I deserve this, mm -hmm. you know, and so we, we talked in the last episode, we want to shove coal in our kids' stockings and say, well, you don't deserve anything, but at the same time, like, we, we should have a healthy understanding that, like, gift giving is entirely on the part of the person who's giving the gift, and for you to appreciate the fact that somebody cared enough about your person mm -hmm. to think about what to give you, and I think that's even one reason why things like white elephant gifts at family Christmas time, they could be kind of funny, but it's like, it's kind of a waste. Yeah. Because like, okay, this is just a stupid thing for whomever. Man, I'd rather have somebody spend five bucks on me and just give me a card that says, hey, praying for you, mm -hmm. and I can put that in my drawer instead of five bucks. Be to honest, you'd rather stupid. someone spend $15 on you and get you one of those poppable things. A what? Is, what isn't that called poppable? The little big-headed dolls you like? Oh, Funko Pops. Funko Pops. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they. Yeah, that's definitely that's my heart language right yeah. now. Yeah, Funko Pops of. Uh, I'm sorry that I misnamed. Yeah, I've got Parks the and Rec. I got Parks and Rec of Funko Pops in my office, and I have a Frank Costanza yeah. Festivus pool Funko Pop. It's not technically a Funko, yeah. but same category. Yeah. So, you see, and and so the, you're expressing another thing here is someone knowing what you desire, what you need. And some, and some parents will break that up and give their kids. I forget what the third gift is, but they'll give them three gifts. One is. One thing you want, one thing you need. Something and then, borrowed, something blue. Yes. Yeah. No. No. Okay. But the idea being, I'm really going to give you one thing that you want because I know what you want and know your desires. Sure. But I'm also going to give you one thing you need because yeah. gift is not all about that. And, and some parents will even bring in a, a component of um, giving to others. Sure. I've liked one of the things my family has done recently, and part of it is just we, we've realized we don't need to spend, um, I don't need to buy 
four gifts, you know, if we have a family of five. So we just draw names. And, and it is kind of fun for me because I, do, I don't do gifts very well. I don't think about them throughout the year. I'm the type of person that December 12th hits and I go, are you kidding Here me? We go. I have to think. And I know that the person I'm giving a gift for wants me to put thought into it, but I don't have time yeah. to put thought into it. And so we have orchestrated it in a way that I can put a lot of thought into one gift for one person. And so each of us is going to get a gift that we wouldn't buy for ourselves that's, gonna, that's going to have thought in it um, and it's going to be kind of crafted by the person. Mm-hmm. I think that makes it really enjoyable. Um, so I think gifts, gifts might be the, the easiest to bring gospel implications to. Sure. Um, one thing, maybe this kid thought I was annoying or not, but I'm going to bring Jesus into everything, <laughs> particularly after church on a Sunday. And so talking to a young lady after church, probably you know, nine years old, and uh, I said, tell me one thing you like. And it's a decent way to engage kids, just a really open-ended question. So I said, tell me one thing you like. And she goes, gifts. And I was, wow. And I'm thinking, is this greedy little Chris Tillman talking to me? <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't jump on her and tell her, you know, you're on the naughty list. I just said, what do you like about gifts? Talk about gifts. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think she gave kind of an interesting answer. She said, I like that they are surprises. And so I said, mm-hmm. okay, and just kind of kept talking with her, kept asking questions, and at the end of our conversation, I just kind of s- gently said, you know, a lot of people were surprised when Jesus came. You know, we mm-hmm. didn't exactly know what he was going to be like, but I'm really glad he came. You salted that. End of conversation. Yeah. You know, it w- I, maybe she remembers it, maybe she never remembers it, but for me it was, uh, I've got a young lady in the church who, is excited about Christmas, and I want to be excited with her, and I want to understand her heart a little bit better, and I also mm-hmm. want her to to draw a gospel implication, yeah. even at a young age, to this mm-hmm. gift that she's going to receive, and mm-hmm. um, and that could be done by by teaching your kids that, uh, hey, Christ, who possessed everything in the universe for a time, gave it up so that He could give Himself to us. So maybe once every three or four years, it's Christmas, we don't get any gifts, we only give gifts. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, 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 I'm just spitballing here, but there are, are ways that we can look at the created thing, the gift, mm-hmm. and redeem it for the purposes yeah. of Christ. Um, actually, we have in our church, someone reached out to me a couple weeks ago and said, hey, I want to do this thing called the gifting tree. Never heard of it before. Um, and I said, <laughs> honestly, as a pastor, I said, oh, you're going to do all the work? Great. Uh, <laughs> I would love to sign off on it. Let me know when you need in the church. And so they set it up, they've done the announcements, and I was a little bit like, I don't know how many people are going to participate in this. The basic idea is you can either write on a card what you need or what you'd like to give. And mm. you put the card on the tree and people can grab it anonymously. And mm. so, you know, someone says, I'd like a fresh baked loaf of bread. Someone can go, I'll take that and I'll deliver mm-hmm. it. And, um, with butter? With, with butter. Yeah. There's got to be 20 cards on there right now. Mm. And uh, I'm encouraged to see that there is a, once again, a created thing that we can move towards... Mm in redemption, just as Christ moved towards us and we can express generosity. Mm-hmm. And um, I think there's just so many ways we can do that yeah. in the holiday season. Amen. And maybe, just maybe, Chris, we'll make you like Christmas music again. You can try. <laughs> try as we might here on A Time to Think. <laughs> try as we might. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for taking some time to think. Uh, we'll see you back on the next episode.